Now, I usually do my mid-year top five phones in June, but I'm a month early for various reasons, not least that I've made up my mind on the models to be highlighted more easily than in 2018. As usual, I factor in value as well as absolute functionality and future-proofing. Two notes though. Firstly, I do have a rule when compiling my top fives. No one manufacturer can feature twice to avoid duplication and to ensure variety, which as you'll see is why both my beloved Galaxy S9 Plus shooting this that I've now used for 12 months essentially, and the Galaxy Note 9, which is the same but with an S Pen, why they aren't in the top five. Secondly, I'm ignoring the second-hand market. You'll have your own favourite route, of course, whether it's stores like CEX in the UK, online auction sites or closed forums like PSE Classifieds on MeWe. I can't emphasise this enough. Buying last year's flagship today is always going to deliver the best bang per buck, as it were. But this top five is understandably about phones still available new and usually at the top of their manufacturer's tree. For my traditional wildcard pick at number five, I'm going with the brand new Google Pixel 3a XL. I'll have this in for formal reviews soon enough. But in the meantime, Google has shaved £400 or so off its pixels by opting for plastic construction, a lower spec chipset, no Qi charging and slightly larger bezels, yet with the same much acclaimed camera system and the same stereo speakers. Yay! Plus on stage, Google admitted that they've heard people like more listening options. So they've admitted their mistake in dropping the 3.5 mil audio jack for the last couple of years. It's back in the 3A range. Hooray. Put it all together. And yes, you could argue that even with the price drop, the Pixel 3A range is still lower spec than some of the competition, but come on, it's a lot closer now. And you do have to factor in those three years of monthly updates, including two major OS versions, at least. That's gotta be worth hundred pounds plus at the very least in my book. And as a bonus, as with the previous Pixels, you get to play with each new version of Android a good six months before anyone else in the general public, thanks to Google's beta program, which I'm currently on with my 3XL. From guaranteed monthly updates at number five to quarterly updates, if you're lucky, we have the latest in the Motorola budget line. The cheapest phone here by miles. For £250 or so, we have a snappy contender with loud stereo speakers, Dolby Atmos, a quality OIS equipped large sensor camera, audio jack, expandable storage, and everything else you might expect. Astonishing value, £250 or so. See my review in Phone Show 362. It's not the best phone in the world, absolutely, but it's by far the best value all-rounder, I contend. PSC's TED says that Motorola usually manages a system update per quarter, and this is currently on January 2019 security. Hmm. I'll keep checking for updates. You can't argue at the suitability of an iPhone for the man in the street where there's little to go wrong and where there's an Apple store, hopefully not too far away if they get into trouble. The XR or XR got some stick for being Apple's new affordable iPhone. It's still over £700, but it still feels superb in the hand, comes in a range of decent colours and makes remarkably few spec compromises from the crazily priced XS flagships. Principally, the main stabilised camera is the same, the chipset is identical, the screen is very nearly as good, you get the same face ID, and the size is neatly between the XS and the XS Max. It's the iPhone to get if you're not sure which £1,000 plus iPhone size variant to get, effectively. A Huawei phone at number two, what am I smoking? Well, actually, I'm drinking the imaging Kool-Aid since the ex-Nokia imaging chief at Huawei finally achieved his aim of a stabilised 40 megapixel lens and genuine five times also stabilised periscope telephoto, as documented at length in the phone show 363 and 364. Now, I've said several times that updates are needed to smooth some rough edges in the imaging, but the P30 Pro is a powerhouse that will only get better with time. And if taking zoomed photos and especially zoomed video are important to you, then look no further. This is the zoom champion among current devices. As it turns out, the P30 Pro is also a fine flagship in other ways. Lovely screen, blazingly fast chipset, plenty of RAM, eight gigabytes, reasonable in-screen fingerprint sensor. Look, it's off, finger on the screen, on every time. Adequate mono speaker, plenty of storage. They'll have to fork out for, quote, nano memory if you do want to expand the built-in 128 gigabyte. There's no 3.5 mil jack, but you do get analog out through a dumb adapter if you need it, or just go Type-C DAC or Bluetooth options all round. And don't be put off by EMUI. It takes no longer to knock into shape than my picket number one in a moment. It's a perfectly fine implementation of Android 9 these days.
But number one, as one of its sister devices has been for quite a while, I can't look further than a Samsung Galaxy. Now, last year's pick, the Note 9, is still around and still superb. And before that, my beloved S9 Plus shooting this is now even cheaper, of course. But trying to keep my top five current, I'm picking this, the cheaper Galaxy S10e, over its more expensive variants, the S10 and S10 Plus. Why? Simply because it has a good old-fashioned capacitive fingerprint scanner built into the power button. It works 100% of the time. Here's a demo. Screen off. Thumb makes contact with the sensor. No need to press. Instantly on. Instant. Job done. You get almost all the usual Samsung goodies too. An insanely good screen. Screaming processor. Loud and clear stereo speakers. Even if not quite as bassy as is possible with the physically larger S10s. Expandable memory via standard micro SD rather than Huawei's new oddball format, a 3.5mm audio jack, blazing charging speeds, full water and dust proofing, and much, much more. True, the S10 drops the 2 times telephoto camera for a wide angle secondary lens, but this is acceptable at the price, I think. Plus, the wide angle is genuinely useful. You'll be impressed. In my tests across all subjects, there are the usual Samsung over-sharpening complaints, but updates will hopefully dial this back. They usually do. And if you need zooming, then forget that P30 Pro I just mentioned. As usual, it's Samsung's take on Android and quite a bit disabled. <coughs> Bixby button, <coughs> legacy navigation button order, and a shuffle around in order to streamline the user experience. So set aside an hour or so after you first turn it on, but it's not too fiddly to do. Look, the S10e is the perfect size for a smartphone, the same as the iPhone 10, incidentally. So it's a true one-handed phone. You can reach the whole screen. You're less likely to drop it, and it fits in any pocket. Highly recommended. This is the Samsung Galaxy S10e at number one.